Good evening and welcome tonight. We're delighted that you've made the choice to come back and be with us for this, our evening service. We're looking forward to the time together, not only the time to be able to fellowship in song and with one another, but to fellowship around the Word of God. We're delighted to have Brother Rand Hummel with the Wilds of New England with us. He'll be speaking later on. Uh, but again, we are glad that you are here and trust that the Lord will bless our time together. It's good to have Brother Bruce Bush here with us as well. And uh, so welcome to you and thank you for stopping and being here with us tonight. But again, we trust that the Lord will give us a wonderful evening. Let's open our time in a word of prayer that Ben's going to come and lead us as we sing. Our Father, we thank you for this evening, for the time that we have to come and gather together again to be able to meet here in your house, to be able to enjoy the fellowship that we have because of Jesus Christ and because of his word. We pray that you would allow the truth of your word tonight to penetrate our hearts, that we would allow that truth to change us and who we are, that we would be not only hearers of your word tonight, but then willingly to do that which we hear and apply to our lives. So Father, we commit this night to you. We pray your blessing in every part. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn for this evening is hymn number 594. 594, a glorious church. We'll sing all three stanzas. Once you found it, I'll invite you to stand with me, please, as we sing hymn number 594, a glorious church. Do you hear them coming, brother, thronging up the steeps of light? Clad in glorious shining garments, blood washed garments pure and white. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Do you hear the stirring and victorious army lift its banner up on high tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle washed in the blood of the lamb tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle washed in the blood of the lamb never fear the clouds of sorrow Never fear the storms of sin. We will triumph on the morrow. Even now our joys begin. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Wash in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Wash in the blood of the Lamb. Then back a few pages to hymn number 588. 588 on Jordan's stormy banks. We'll sing the first and the last of hymn number 588 on Jordan's stormy banks. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. Thank you for your good singing tonight. 
couple things if I could by way of announcement before the men come for our evening offering. First of all, let me just say a word of thanks. We been asking for someone to be able to cover the month of May uh, for our junior church. That slot has now been filled, and we praise the Lord for that. That leaves August, so August is available for you if you would like to be able to help us with our junior church ministry. Again, May's been covered, but August is the only available date that we still need to fill, so if you'd be willing to help us with that, then you go ahead and sign up for that. Also, there is some sign-ups for some Easter flowers. Some of you have already signed up for that. Please be sure to go ahead and sign up if you would like to do so. Also, we want to remind you that this Friday is the Lebanon Christian Academy's Walkathon. Again, so you be praying uh, about that as our young people are involved and have a good fun day, as well as an opportunity to raise some money for the school. And again, we praise the Lord for his goodness, his provisions in our school this year. And so the monies that will be coming in will be going to advance our ministry to uh, help our teachers uh, not trying to pay salaries or to meet budget. All of that's going to be met, we know, by the Lord. And so these, uh, we are thankful, will be able to be used to do some advancement and enhancing of our ministry. Also, you may have seen a post on our Facebook about some LCA gear. That's some t-shirts and some sweatshirts. If you were interested in any of that, there's just six hours left before that online store ends. Okay, and then it will be here then by the end of the month. So if you would like to have something to support the school and you can walk around and display that uh, proudly wherever you go, then you have six hours left to go make those purchases. There's a company uh, that we use. It's called Shirt Masters. The young man that runs that ministry is actually in New Hampshire. And uh, he is a Christian young man and has a desire to be able to use the gifts and talents that God has given uh, for the Lord, and they do a wonderful job. So, uh, again, go to our Facebook page. You'll find the link. Six hours, well, just under six hours now. It closes at midnight, and you can make those purchases for those things. By the way, it's, that's not a fundraiser. That's just for your benefit so you can have some nice things to wear and support our school that way. It's not raising any funds uh, for it, so that's not a pitch. I'm not getting any profit or kickback from that, just so that you know. Okay. Mixed ensemble, there's a practice tonight after the evening service, so please, if you're involved with that, be sure to meet there at the uh, piano tonight. And uh, men also, after the, uh, if you're not in the mixed ensemble, we could get some help to clear the platform again for the play practice for the school. Uh, that will be a help to us as well. At the end of the service tonight, as you leave, there will be plates in the back for Brother Rand as a love offering for him and for the Wilds of New England. And so we want you to be aware of that and trust that you'll be able to give and be a blessing to them for him willing to take his time to come and be with us. Again, appreciate his uh, ministry and what the Lord has been doing uh, in and through him over the many years, serving through the wilds and now the wilds of New England. Uh, so again, we'll take a love offering at the end of the night. Plates will be there in the back. Young men, if you would, go ahead and come tonight as we take up the offering for this evening. As we continue to give as under the Lord and trusting that he'll continue to supply all of our needs. And we know that he will. Matthew, would you lead us please in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we could be here tonight. And uh, I pray that this offering would uh, be used well for your honor and glory. I pray that you would bless it. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>
Our last hymn before the preaching tonight is hymn number 478. 478, it is well with my soul. We'll sing all four stanzas. Stand with me, please, one last time as we sing 478, it is well with my soul. singing this evening you may be seated in just a moment brother wayne's going to come and sing for us before our speaker comes before wayne comes and sings let me just introduce our speaker brother Rand hummel is the director of the wilds of new england he's been serving the lord in camp ministry and the lord has used him in a wonderful way over the years to have the ability to have a wonderful ministry especially in the lives of teenagers and college age young people. I've appreciated and benefited from Rand's ministry over these years. I think I told you this morning that it was on my senior trip that I first heard Rand, not one that I took as a counselor, but actually as one of the kids going on a senior trip. That's how long he's been doing this. And uh, we, we appreciate, there you go. He doesn't look it, I do, he doesn't. Uh, but again, we appreciate so much what the Lord has done through his life. I will tell you that on my senior trip, 
It was the Lord started to get a hold of my heart and bring me back to Him so that I was prepared when I went off to college in my freshman year to have the Lord lead and direct me and then to call me to the ministry in February of 1992. And so I praise the Lord for the ministry of the wilds. I praise the Lord for the ministry that Brother Rand has had over the years and thankful to have been able to work with them and partner with them there in New England through our church ministry, having our young people go there, our children benefiting from that ministry. And uh, so again, we're delighted to have him here tonight. I know that your heart will be blessed as he opens God's word. He's a clear communicator of that truth. And we're looking forward to what he has in store for us tonight. And then you'll be praying for him as he ministers in our academy tomorrow as we will have a special chapel with him. And again, I know that he'll be a benefit and a blessing to our young people there. So Brother Wayne, you come and sing tonight. And then Brother Rand, after he's finished, we hand you the pulpit tonight. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and on the earth again shall stand. I know eternal life He giveth, that grace and power are in His hand. I know, I know that Jesus liveth, and on the earth again shall stand I know I know that life he giveth that grace and power are in his hand I know his promise never faileth the word he speaks it cannot die the cruel death my flesh I say Yet it shall be him by and by. I know, I know that Jesus liveth, and on the earth again shall stand. I know, I know that life he giveth, that grace and power are in his hand. I know my mansion he prepareth, that where he is, there I may be. Oh, wondrous thought for me he careth, and that I think I'm by and by. I know, I know that Jesus liveth, and on the earth again shall stand. I know, I know that life he giveth, that grace and power are in his hand. All God's people said, amen. amen. I know, I know, I know. I think he must be reading 1 John lately, don't you think so? because he knows what the truth is. That is wonderful. Hey, it's a joy to be with you. It really is. Uh, always a joy to come back to Pennsylvania. I was born in Pennsylvania, Wilkes-Barre. I grew up around the Bloomsburg area, and uh, it is one of the coolest states in all the 50 states. I really believe that. I do. Uh, I mean, it's the only state in the Union where on the first day of buck season, they not only get off school, but even the women grow beards for buck season. It's just a wonderful <laughs> place. It is. And uh, that's Pennsylvania. What a joy it is. Uh, <clears throat> I want you to turn to Psalm 100 tonight. We're going to kind of dig into Psalm 100. As you're turning there, for those who have been involved in, in the camping ministry, and I have had the privilege to be with the Wilds for a long time. We, my wife and I, Amber, had 30 years uh, in, in North Carolina serving there. And then around 2008, I was like 50 and somehow thought I was way too old to be in camping. And so I stepped aside for some of my dear friends like Willie and Matt and Scott and those guys and had no idea we were going to go to New England. Figured we'd probably end up pastoring. I actually thought I'd probably be pastoring in Pennsylvania. Uh, I tell my wife I'm a converted 
Pennsylvania redneck. She says, you're not converted. You are in Christ, but not from the Pennsylvania redneck part, okay? I still drive a Jeep with big wheels and all that. So uh, that's just part of the, um, and I tell you, when I went to Bob Jones University from Pennsylvania, they didn't even let me check in. I had a heart for God. They didn't know me, but I mean, I had the boots and I had the belt buckle and I, they said, you have to go get a haircut. And it's just, it was, I was a Pennsylvania redneck. I really was. And you know exactly what I mean. So it's always good. It really is just to be back and just the beauty driving around. It's been wonderful. It has. God has blessed the camp and we're so thankful. We didn't go to New England, honestly, to build a camp. Just went to encourage teens to know God and love God more. And honestly, that's what I have the privilege to do everywhere I go. Um, <clears throat> our kids live in a yucky world, don't they? It's a tough one to grow up in. It is. I wish we could live back in the days of a little house in the prairie, you know? Then all we'd have to deal with was like Nellie's attitude. But we don't live in that day. <clears throat> it's a tough day. But still, even though there's a lot of sorrow and there's heartache and the culture has just literally gone crazy, Psalm 100 is the same. And I love Psalm 100. I get the privilege to preach in a lot of Christian schools. And if you preach in a Christian school sometime around Thanksgiving, you're going to see all the little kids come in. They're dressed up like pilgrims and Indians, and they all line up, and they quote the old 100. In fact, let's do it together tonight. Ready? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Have you ever wondered what people will remember about you. Seriously. When your kids go off to college, what do they say about you? What do your grandkids remember about you? They usually forget what we say, but they don't forget what we are. They don't. I was thinking about driving down here. I was thinking about, man, all my educational experience right here in Pennsylvania. First grade. My teacher's name was Mrs. Young. She was at least 140, you know? And I always wondered why they called her Mrs. Young. Third grade, her name was Mrs. Brader, and this was a while ago, but I literally got my mouth washed out with soap because I happened to call her Brader Potato, okay? And I shouldn't have done that. Fourth grade, and these are little tiny, these are the schools that were little, and we'd have a bunch of grades in one room. Some of you remember that. Fourth grade, her name was Mrs. Thomas, and right before recess, she said, okay, everybody step straight. And she would open up her favorite book, Gulliver's Travels. And she would read it in such a way that the Lilliputians and Gulliver, they would come alive, okay? Um, seventh grade started our high school where I grew up in Central Columbia. Seventh grade, her name was Miss Volveris. She was 22, I was 12. I knew it would work out. <laughs> <coughs> I was so in love with her. I had a crush on her, and I, I, I actually joined the course. She was a course teacher, and, and I joined the course just so I could stare at her, you know? Now, in our high school, public high school, we had about 200 in the chorus. 195 girls and five boys whose voices had not changed, okay? And so we had to sing this song, Shine, Little Glow, Worm, Glimmer, Glimmer. And they turned the lights out, and we had these little flashlights, and then you talk about getting mocked walking down the hall on a glimmer, glimmer. So that was the end of that. <clears throat> uh, let's see, I think it was uh, Mrs. White Knight. Um, she taught typing back when they had, we had typewriters back then, you know? And she walked around with this ruler and had one of those little ruler with a metal on the side. And if you would look down at your hand, whack, she would, she'd whack your hands. If you look down at them while you were typing. So I still to this day type like this, okay? Mr. Spade, he was 11th grade. He was our geometry teacher. I don't remember anything about geometry. He had a glass eye. I'm not kidding. We'd be doing a test or something. I'd look up and he'd go like this. He'd reach in, he'd yank that thing out, stick it in his mouth and wash it off and put it back in. <laughs> That's all I remember about that guy. <laughs> Went off to college, 
And that was a shock because I wasn't, I was raised in a pretty difficult home situation, but went to a Bible college and there's this guy named Mr. Poa and he would literally start his math class with a blessing from 2 Kings. I didn't even know where 2 Kings was in the Bible at that time. What a blessing. Then there was a guy named Jesse Boyd. Uh, Jesse Boyd, he was a big man, moved very slowly. Conviction, oh, he had convictions about things that weren't even in the Bible, okay? But I, I loved his teaching, and I was looking for someone who was strong in what they believed. Every semester, all eight semesters, I took one of his Bible courses. He, when he got older, he got that Lou Gehrig's disease, and it took him down, he died very quickly from it. But I, I was talking to his wife after he passed away. She said, you know, Randy wanted to die at home, and so we got a hospital bed, and I just remember one time I was getting him all comfortable. I went to leave the room, and I just turned around and looked at him, and I looked at him, he went like this. And he died. Now, why did I tell you about all those teachers? Every single one of us will be remembered for something. And when God says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, he means a joyful noise. When he says, serve the Lord with what? Grumpiness. No, gladness. And, and come before his presence with complaining. What will your kids and grandkids remember about you? Could I, personally, and you ask yourself this question, could I be described as someone who is known for their joy, their singing, and their gladness? Uh, joyful noise is ruah, and it means to shout or to split with the ear. Uh, the word for gladness is simcha, and it literally means a brightness shining. It is a joy that can only be seen in the countenance. It's a brightness of the eyes and a smile on the face. And then singing is rinna, and again it means a joyous shouting, a song of triumph. So if you put these together, true biblical joy is an uninhibited expression of delight in what God has done for me. Can I say that again? An uninhibited expression of delight in what God has done for me. Do your kids, do your grandkids see that in your life? This is a command of God. <clears throat> and when we have to almost ask, why? Why should my life be characterized by joyfulness, by gladness, and singing? Look at verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. Why should our lives be characterized by joy and singing? Number one, because God made me. Say it with me. Because God made me. Now, I'm not really smart, but I do know how to Google, okay? And if you know how to Google, you can pretend you're smart. Did you know that the world <clears throat> in which we live is truly an amazing and wondrous place? It defies evolutionary explanation. It's home to a cheetah cat that can run 70 miles an hour. Insects that can sleep for 17 years straight. An eight-armed, ink-shooting octopus that can eat their own arms and grow new ones. Guys, we never have to carry a lunch to school. Wouldn't that be great? <clears throat> There's a little beetle called the bombardier beetle. It's a small insect armed with an impressive defense system. Whenever threatened by enemy attack, the spirit of the little beetle blasts irritating and odious gases 212 degrees Fahrenheit out of two tailpipes. The beetle makes the explosion by mixing together two very dangerous chemicals. He adds an inhibitor which prevents the chemicals from blowing up, enables the beetle to store the chemical indefinitely. When attacked, the beetle at precisely the right time adds an anti-inhibitor that gets rid of the inhibitor and then it blows up in the face of the guy chasing after him. Now, if you believed in evolution, it would take hundreds of years for him to get the timing right. And every time somebody could, poof, he'd blow himself up, okay? Then there's a sea slug lives along the sea coast, and it feeds primarily on what's called sea anemones. Now, the sea anemones are equipped with thousands of small stinging cells which can explode at the slightest touch, plunging poisonous harpoons into the attacker. The intruder is paralyzed, drawn into an enemy's stomach, and digested. Although that's pretty impressive. This little guy, the sea slug, somehow can neutralize them grab a hold of them, push them down through this little tunnel thing into a pouch that it carries with it. 
keeps them there for when it's attacked, it takes them out of the pouch, throws them back at the intruder, and he protects himself with the same poisonous arrows that were supposed to take him down. Now folks, if God will do that for a bug and a slug, just think of what he's done for us. God made me. He did. And he made you just the way you are, okay? And I hope you understand the joy of this. I mean, take, for instance, your eye. Look in somebody's eye right now. Just look in somebody's eye. Automatic aperture, automatic adjustment. You can see a mountain miles away, the diameter of a hair. And every night when we go to bed, God sends in a maintenance crew to clean it all up so it's all ready to go the next day. Isn't that amazing? And how about that DNA stuff? Who's the teacher here in the school? Let me see your hands real high. Can you spell that? <clears throat> no, never mind. I'm just teasing. <clears throat> I don't really understand it, but it is determines the arrangement of 206 bones, 600 muscles, 10,000 auditory nerve fibers, two vessels, uh, excuse me, two uh, billion nerve cells, four billion feet of blood vessels and capillaries. And it fits on a teaspoon. Whoa, this is an amazing thing. In Psalm 139, a big time paraphrase, God went into his workshop and he made you. He made me. And he got all the chromosomes together. By the way, did you hear what the one chromosome said to the other chromosome? Do these genes make me look fat? Anyway, he got all this stuff together. And he made you with the color of your eyes and the texture of your hair. He gave you the gift to work with your hands or to play a piano or to sing. He made you because he wants you to impact certain individuals for Christ. And you know what we do? We stand in front of a mirror and complain about how God made us that we can't sing, or we don't look like this, or we don't have this ability or this talent. God created every single one of us in his perfect way to impact those he's called us to impact. And we're not only created by him, remember Colossians, we're created for him. To spend forever and forever and forever in heaven. Do you look forward to that day? I really, really do. Just think to be on the new earth, the, the, the flesh, the devil, the, uh, all these, are gone. The devil's locked up. The world is brand new. The incorruptible put on, uh, uh, the corruption put on incorruptible. There'll be no reason to sin. You know what I want to do on the new earth? I want to do just what Adam did. What did he do? Two things. He worked and he walked with God in the cool of the day. That's why I live, love living in New England, because it's the cool day, is all day long. Okay, but he worked, and, we, and, and most of you guys enjoy working. And we'll have something to do with purpose for our wonderful Lord. Because God made me. And I get to spend forever with him. But that's not the only reason. Look down at your text again. Look at the end of verse 3. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Did you notice those two personal pronouns? His people, the sheep of his pasture. Why should our lives be characterized by joy and gladness and singing? Because God made me, but number two, because God saved me. Say it with me, because God saved me. Are you glad you're saved today? Aren't you glad that your sins are forgiven? You're on your way to heaven? Do you remember that day when you're overwhelmed with your wickedness and you cried out to God and he forgave you? It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing because God saved me. We are the sheep of his pasture, okay? And the shepherd gave his life for us that we can live with him forever. We are his pasture. People. Now that phrase means a lot to me. Let me explain why. I grew up in a very, very difficult home. Uh, a lot of anger, a lot of abuse. And finally, our mom, she left us <clears throat> when I was about eight, ran off, had an affair. And uh, it was an angry home. It was a tough home. Uh, so I was raised primarily by my grandparents, okay? Now my granddad, he was my pal, but he drank really, really heavy. And if you've ever been around the alcoholic, it's tough. My grandma on the other side, now this is all here in Pennsylvania, up near Dallas, Nanny Coke area. My grandma was precious. She was, she was a Polish lady. She was only, only about 4'11", both ways. So she was a wonderful, wonderful lady. <laughs> she lived to be 97. 
But her mind started going when she was in her early 80s. And, and uh, she was in a nursing home up in Tunkhannock. And any time I'd come through Pennsylvania, I'd make sure I went and saw her. Now, Graham was really strong physically, and she'd walk around. She carried her purse on this arm. When I'd stop to visit her, she'd stick her arm through my arm, and we'd be walking around. I said, well, Graham, how you doing? And she'd look at me and smile and say, life is but a dream. I said, how's the food here? Is it pretty good? And she would say, life is but a dream. One time when I was there, she had a new boyfriend. He was a lot younger than her. He's like 92 or something. But I remember I said, I, said, I met your new friend. He's really nice. And she would say, life is but a dream. That's all she could say is life is but a dream. So we got into the lobby, and uh, one time my son was with me, he plays piano. I said, hey, bud, play the piano for her, Graham. So he started playing Amazing Grace. Her eyes lit up. She started going like this, like she thought she was the one playing. And when we got done, I said, Graham, you did great. And she had this big smile, and she said, life is but a dream. I said, play your all-time favorite song, How Great Thou Art. And I'm not a good singer, but I thought, I'm going to sing it to her. And he started to play, and I had a hold of her hands, and I just started to sing, Oh, Lord, my God. And all of a sudden, she started singing with me. Every word, all the way through the first verse, all the way through the chorus. And now I'm crying, say, yes, God brought her mind back. This is wonderful. We finished the song. She said, Graham, that was wonderful. And she looked at me and said, life is but a dream. I said, oh, I know that song, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, but I like this song better. She said, so do I, because it has more of God in it. I said, Graham. And she said, life is but a dream. I only saw her one more time before she went off into eternity. And by this time, she would just sit in her wheelchair and just stare. Okay? And she didn't talk. And I remember going to see her, and I got down on one knee, and I was holding her hands and looking in her eyes, and it was... Seriously, almost like looking down tunnels of time. And while I'm just talking to her and sharing with her that I love her, she started shaking. She took her hand, pointed to me, and said this, you're my people. She knew I was hers. I was special to her. She was special to me. Hey, Christian, God says, you're my people. And in a world that can't even figure out its own identity, what identity do we have? We're a child of God. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thing? So why should my life be characterized by joy, gladness, and singing? God made me, and I get to spend forever with him. God saved me. But how? How do you express that joy? Look at verse 4. Enter into his gates with, tell me, and into his courts with what? Praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Do you tell God thank you a lot? I hope you do. If you, came, if you were a kid and came to the wilds or a teen, you would hear me say over and over, we need to thank God for saving us every single day of our lives. Yes. Lord, good morning. Oh, thank you for saving me. I need you today. I can't do today without you. Have a good morning prayer that thanks God for your salvation. I led one kid to the Lord. He was 14, totally unchurched. <clears throat> we were sitting on the hillside, and I was explaining salvation. And, and he's looking at me, saying, so God will forgive me? So I can spend forever with him? I know I'm a sinner. I said, yeah. He said, well, explain to me. What do I do? And I told him, you know, what to pray. And he said, oh. And so I remember sitting on the hillside. He crossed his arms, closed his eyes. He put his head up. He said, God, if anybody needs to be saved, I do. And he went ahead and prayed and accepted the Lord. But when he got done, he didn't know what to do. He wasn't raised like you guys where you say, in Jesus' name, amen, or as we pray in the name of Jesus. So he just sat there, arms crossed, eyes closed, head up. I looked up to see if he was done. He's going like this. And after the longest time, he goes, well, thank you, and looked at me. Seriously, when was the last time after a wonderful service here with Pastor, or maybe after one of those special mornings when you got up early and spent time with your Lord, you just stopped and said, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't deserve to be saved. I never did. Thank you for saving me. Hey, Mom and Dad, don't you love when your kids thank you? 
I mean, even as we get older, for a child who's in their 40s or even later, and to text, say, thank you for being so good to me and all good memory. Don't you love that? Don't you realize what that even means to the Lord? Every time you enter into his presence, gates, courts, you always bring a gift of thanksgiving. Even Philippians 4 talks about prayer. Be careful for nothing. Be full, anxious, be full of care, anxious for nothing. But instead, a prayer and supplication, and then it's the next little tiny word. It's the word with. Okay, with thanksgiving. And sometimes we think we pray and then we add on thanksgiving. That's not what that means. Literally, it means this. Don't be full of care, anxious about anything. But in the midst of thanking God, let your request be made known to him. Lord, thank you for my wife. I know sometimes we butt heads, but thank you for her. Help me to be more loving and less harsh. Lord, thank you for my husband. I know there's times we just can't seem to get it together, but thank you for bringing him light. Lord, thank you for my kids. I know I get frustrated sometimes, but Lord, thank you that you gave me the privilege to tell them about Jesus and what he did for See what I'm saying? And it even goes farther than that because what do we read in verse 5? The Lord is good. Can you really thank God for cancer? Can you really thank God for being rejected because you had a strong testimony for God? Do you know when people reject you maybe even fire you, do you realize at that point you're probably the closest thing to God they have ever seen? And when it comes to the heart attacks and the loss of jobs and the cancer, are they not the very thing that makes us pray more? Why is it that we despise or look down on that which makes us trust more and pray more? Even when it comes, how many of you are grandparents? Let me see your hands, grandparents. Which one of your grandparents have the best looking, most intelligent grandkids? Let me see your hands. <laughs> and we do pray for them, and I'm sure you do. But you know it's kind of sad sometimes what we pray. Lord, make sure you supply all their needs, and Lord, keep them healthy, and don't let them get hurt and protect them. Wait a minute. Maybe God wants our kids to suffer financial problems so they learn to trust him more. Maybe he wants them to go through a serious illness so they depend on him more. I usually use the Colossians 1 prayer. It's a long prayer, but boil down, Lord, keep my kids in your will today. Lord, keep them in your word today and do something to make them thankful for their salvation. That's it. That's it. So when we pray, we realize that God is good. Look what it says next. His mercy is everlasting. Now, I doubt any of you have thought this. Maybe it's just me. But those of us who have struggled through life, I don't know if you've ever had that little bit of fear that you get to heaven and about 10 years later, the Lord says, now I remember what you did. Will he ever do that? Mm-mm. No. And by the way, he doesn't forget our sins. He does not forget our sins. And therefore, when you forgive others, you say, forgive and forget. Thy word is preserved in heaven, O Lord. David's adultery, Peter's denial, is written down for all to see for forever. What the Bible says, your iniquity, your sin, will I separate as far as the east is from the west? I will bring it to my remembrance no more. He doesn't forget because he's omniscient. He's immutable. He can't increase or decrease in knowledge. It's impossible for the character of God for him to forget. But he chooses not to ever bring us to us again. That's mercy. In other words, forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is a promise. And this is what our God does. And I don't have to fear because there's no fear in love. Perfect love cast out fear. Because at first John, our wonderful Lord, looks at me just like he looks at his son Jesus. He really does because I'm in Christ. The Lord is good. His mercy endures for, for, is everlasting. And look what it says that his truth, his truth will come to every generation. 
Now, some of us that are older, we get all worried and concerned that the church is falling apart and what's going to happen to our young people. God will make sure every generation of these little guys will understand his precious truth. This is a wonderful God. So why should my life not be ex expressing joy and gladness? Why would our kids ever remember that we were grumpy or grouchy or worried or mad, tired all the time? And sadly, when we get our focus on us and not on our wonderful God, that's what happens. But instead, come before his presence with singing. Let your joyfulness be made known to all your family. Granddad, even dad, would you grab your phone once in a while and text your grandsons? Hey, I was reading in Psalm 51, God sure is a forgiving God. Yeah. Let them know the joy that you have in the Lord. The greatest evangelistic tool that any of us can have is the joy of the Lord. Because people look at you and think, whoa, whoa. The world is dark, it's sad. Why are you so joyful? Because God made me and because God saved me. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for this precious psalm. And none of us in this room deserve your goodness, your forgiveness, your grace, but oh, thank you. Thank you so much for what you have done for us. And I thank you for this body of believers here tonight who are willing to come out on Sunday night and hear your precious word preached. Lord, would you please just put a hedge around this church and protect it from all the worldliness that could try to creep in, but also, Lord, would you use it to show other people the joy of knowing you? Thank you, dear Lord, for all that you have done. As we pray in the name of Jesus and all God's joyful people said, amen. amen. I certainly appreciate being with you. Pastor's going to come in a second and close. Uh, in regards to Wiles, New England, people say, what can we do? Would you do a favor for me? Would you pray? Seriously, would you just pray that, number one, in our camps, we already have over 1,100 signed up. We can only take about 1,250, okay? But just pray that it would be so obvious the word of God is so there that the kids will truly get it. We see many kids get saved every summer, okay? So I really, really want you, want you to pray that, that God would just give us one of the greatest summers. New England needs God. Pennsylvania needs God. True? And what a joy it is. Please do pray for them. Again, there are many even from Pennsylvania that will travel up this summer to the wilds of New England and benefit from that ministry. So you'll be praying now even for the Lord's work to be done there at the camp. Ben, come and lead us in a closing hymn, and then we'll close our time in prayer. Hymn number 581. 581, be an example. I'll invite you to stand with me, please, one last time as we sing Be an Example, 581. Many now are watching the footsteps that we take. Many soon will follow.
thought for you and I to consider that we have an opportunity and even a responsibility to be an example for the next generation. One of the blessings again of a ministry like the Wilds is that they are seeking to have an impact on the coming generations and even as we saw tonight there is the truth that God's word endures to all generations and what a blessing it is that we can have that impact even through the things that we do here at Open Door Baptist Church, through even ministries like Lebanon Christian Academy, to be able to have an impact on the generations to come as we give to them and impart to them the truth. You have a wonderful opportunity uh, to do that. Years ago, I remember hearing someone say, to someone, you are the greatest example of what a believer is. There's a young person that is looking at you. Perhaps it's in your family. Perhaps it's someone within our church. Perhaps it's someone within our school who knows who you are. They look to you and they have chosen you as their example because to you, you are the greatest example. You've become a hero to them. They look up to you. Uh, don't ever forget that. Uh, so take the opportunities, even as we were reminded tonight, to exude that joy of the Lord in everything that we do. What a blessing it is to know that we can have that impact in the days to come. Let's close our time in a word of prayer. And again, as you go, there will be opportunity for you to purchase some books if need be, but then to give an offering to be a blessing to Brother Rand and to the Wilds. Father, we thank you and praise you again for this opportunity that we have to come and be here together tonight. Thank you for the joy of your word. Thank you for its truth. It's a challenge to our hearts and to our lives. Lord, to be reminded that we live before you, the audience of one, with the desire that we might exalt and praise your name. We live as well before a world who is ever watching, and we have the opportunity not only to be to the praise and honor and the glory of your name, but Lord, to be able to point others to you. So help us, Father, in the way that we live, to do so with joy and to do so with gladness, to enter into your courts daily with thanksgiving that we could again continue to rejoice in the Lord always, and again to rejoice. So, Father, we thank you again for this time. We thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together tonight. Bless us as we go. Cause us to be a blessing to others this week as we go from this place. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless, folks. You are dismissed. <laughs>